Welcome, everyone. I'm, um, I'm a long way away, so I might have to shout. I'm actually in Canada. I'm on the west coast on a little island off the west coast of Canada called Vancouver Island. Bob said, why don't I come down and visit him sometime? Bob, that's a long, long way away. So, so uh, uh, welcome, everyone. I'm also um, a retired physician. Uh, I retired uh, a few years ago and spend my used to spend my time down in Mesa, Arizona. Uh, now I spend it uh, working on a show that I produce with my uh, partner, Huey Popluck. We have a, a show we produce once a week. Actually, we have two. We, we not only had to do the Monday show, but we have a Thursday show. So I've gone from, um, from, from being a physician to being a radio broadcaster. The only problem is, as a physician, I got paid. This job, I don't get paid. So it's uh, so I'm working pretty hard at it. We do have a show on Monday. You're welcome to come. I was talking to Bob about the information. We do a, a regular weekly Monday show. It's about uh, technology for seniors. And we also do a Thursday show, which is uh, we review the news, technology news of the week. So today I'm going to talk about actually uh, healthcare. And uh, as we get older, uh, you're probably wondering, um, with the new technology, how can this help you or how can this benefit um, your health? So I guess, you know, it's interesting. Um, let's take our joints. You know, uh, I don't know, some of you may have had joint replacement, but one of the problems as we get older, we have problems with our joints. And my wife's going to have uh, her knee replaced. And many of you probably have had that surgery. And that's just because we're getting old and the, the knee wears out and we need a new knee. Uh, back when I was uh, uh, practicing medicine, it was about a 10-day 10 uh, 10-day event in the hospital. Uh, now it's daycare surgery. Can you believe that? <laughs> Don't even get mention. It's a daycare procedure. It's truly amazing that what, what has happened. But, but we have all these cool things that we can do, like, uh, like joint replacement. And then uh, the other thing that often happens to us as we get older, we can't see as well. And we all need, uh, not only do we need glasses, but we sometimes have cataracts. And again, uh, that's certainly a cause of major blindness in, in a large part of the world. But a simple little 20-minute surgery can solve that problem. And man, many of you have had cataract surgery and had your, your, uh, your eyes fixed, and it works great. So lots of things that we can do to help you. Uh, the next thing, of course, uh, is what we're going to talk about today is your heart. And uh, that's uh, that's something that uh, just like your knees and just like your eyes, sometimes your heart needs a little help. And as you get older, and and certainly uh, your heart can be, be a problem. And I'm not going to talk about the diseased heart where it's plugged up with cholesterol and all that sort of stuff, but I'm just going to talk about a regular heart that's just getting old. And sometimes it needs a little help, and sometimes it uh, it just doesn't it just doesn't do the same thing it, it did when it was twenty years old, right? Like nothing works as good as it did when it was twenty, right? So your heart sometimes needs a little help, and of course, one of the big problems with hearts is sometimes they can slow down, and they just get tired and old, and they just they just need a little help to keep going, and that's of course. Um, when you need a pacemaker, and many of you in the audience tonight, maybe you have a pacemaker, maybe you've known someone that has a pacemaker, but over the age of 60, uh, the incidence of requiring pacemaker insertion goes up exponentially with age. And you're going to see that in the videos I'm going to show you tonight um, about, about that, because that's really an important issue, is the slow heart rate. And, and that's bad for seniors, because what happens when your heart rate gets really slow is the blood flow doesn't go up into the brain and it can cause um, you to crash your car. You're driving down the highway and all of a sudden you lose consciousness and, and bad things can happen. Or, or you're going down some stairs or up some stairs and you fall because, because of that and then you break, break a hip or something and that leads to really big problems. So a slow heartbeat is, is not a good thing, but it's a common thing when you're, when you're a senior. So Part of the technology we're going to talk about today is, is measuring your heartbeat because all these devices, it's, you get a $10 watch, you wear it on your wrist, heck, it'll tell you if your heart's going too slow. 
So no senior should be walking around unless they have something on their wrist that's going to alert them if their heart's going too darn slow, right? Simple. It's going to cost you maybe $10 for a watch and you can stick it on your wrist and away you go. The next thing that, uh, the next thing is, of course, sometimes your heart speeds up. You know, obviously we talk about a slow heartbeat. Well, we'll let's talk about a real fast heartbeat. And, and this is where your heart speeds up. Again, it's old. It's just, it's just not functioning as well. And the regulatory system in it just makes it really, really fast. And that's called atrial fibrillation. Same problem. It occurs after the age of 60. It occurs exponentially. And again, um, this, the side, one of the side effects of atrial fibrillation is, of course, uh, stroke. And you don't want to have a stroke because that's really going to mess up your enjoyment at Sun City. It's not going to be very happy if you end up with a stroke. But, you know, again, after the age of 60, it goes up exponentially. The incidence of atrial fibrillation goes up exponentially as you get older. So when you get to be 80 years old, there's a very high chance that you may have periods of atrial fibrillation. And of course, that can lead to stroke. It's one of the third, third lead leading cause of stroke in the United States. So uh, again, wouldn't that be cool if we could wear something on our wrist? It goes too fast. Bingo, it tells you, and you can go and get treatment. So for very little money, wearing something on your wrist is, is, going, to, um, is going to give you a lot of benefit and help you. And I've chosen three videos to show you tonight that I've made. And we're going to play these videos. Um, I'm going to play them. I'm going to do the first one. It's called um, How to Prevent Stroke with a Smartwatch. And we'll talk about some of the things that we've talked about tonight. Uh, let's play the video. If you have any questions, we can talk about that and see how you go. So let's, um, let me just play this video and see, see if everything goes okay. Your heart, and your... your heart and your watch, what seniors must know. There are new features coming to some smartwatches that will make these a must for seniors. In this video, we'll look at what these features are, what watches will be affected, and why it is so important that you as a senior watch this video. It's Ron Brown with Tech for Senior, where we make videos to help seniors understand technology. Today, though, I'm going to take my YouTube creator's jacket off and put on my medical jacket. Yes, I'm going to draw on the 35 years of experience I've had looking after people as a family physician and working in emergency departments. So today I want to talk to you about some significant changes that are occurring to smartwatches that will make these invaluable for seniors. So you need to know what a very common heart condition is called atrial fibrillation. Now in this graph you're going to see, and this is from my very popular Saving Your Life with Wearable Technology. As you can see the, in this graph that over the age of 60, the incidence of atrial fibrillation goes up exponentially. This is so important for you to understand. Let's have a look at actually what atrial fibrillation is. So in this diagram, you'll see that there are four chambers in a heart. There are the two upper chambers called the atrium, and there are the two big chambers at the bottom called ventricles. So the two chambers in the heart at the top, the atrium, contract down, putting blood into the bottom big chambers that pump the blood out. Now the right ventricle goes to the lung and the left ventricle, of course, is the big one that goes to the rest of the body. So that's how the blood flows through our heart. Now in atrial fibrillation, there's a problem. In other words, those two chambers in the top, those atrium, start to speed up. And oh my gosh, they go awful fast. They get going at a rapid rate so that they're just quivering they're not actually contracting down. Now you're going to say, oh my gosh, that's terrible. You'd probably die, but that's not the case. Most people with atrial fibrillation can live very normal lives. In fact, the problem is they don't even know they have the condition. 
there's a stopgap between those top two chambers and the bottom chambers, so the bottom chambers just can keep contracting down. And it turns out that you don't need those top two chambers to push blood down into those bottom two chambers. So what happens is this, is that atrial fibrillation occurs, and it occurs when you don't even notice you have any symptoms. That's the problem. So the top two chambers all of a sudden go very rapid. They, they are sort of fluttering and they're, they're not actually contracting down. Now what this does is this causes clots in those, those big atrial chambers. And the blood clots then can move down into the ventricles. In the case of the left, left ventricle, goes up into the brain and causes strokes. And that's why atrial fibrillation is the third cause of stroke. So, and people don't know they have it. So this is why it's so important that as a senior, we understand what atrial fibrillation is and that there can be no symptoms of that. And you just end up with uh, a disease that you don't want. You don't want to have a stroke, right? So how can watches help with this? What advantages would there be in purchasing a smartwatch? Well, the three that I've talked about before and done a number of videos about are, of course, the Apple Watch, the Galaxy 4 Watch, and the Fitbit Sense. Now, why is this so important? Well, these three watches have a unique feature that they can do. Not only can they do what we call an ECG, but they can interpret the ECG and tell you if you have atrial fibrillation. These have all had scientific studies behind them and all are approved by the FDA in the United States. They're also approved in Canada and many other countries around the world because they have the data to back up how they're doing this. So what happens is these watches can do an ECG. The ECG on the watch gets interpreted and it will tell you immediately when we do the ECG if you have atrial fibrillation or you don't. So that's pretty cool. It will certainly do that. And these watches work in conjunction with a cell phone. So these watches, of course, are paired with a cell phone. That This data is then stored in a PDF format on your smartphone. This, of course, can be shown to your healthcare provider. It can be emailed to your healthcare provider, or of course, it can be sent to your cardiologist. The studies have shown this is very accurate. Now, you must understand that an ECG done on your watch is not like the ECG we do in hospitals. In the hospital, when we do a 12-lead ECG, we can look at the past, present, and future of your heart. It gives us a lot of data. The ECG that we do on these smart watches only has one specific function, and that is to tell if you have or have not got atrial fibrillation. It doesn't tell you if you have a heart attack. It doesn't tell you if you need to go to the hospital. None of that is true. All of the ECG function does is it tells you if you have atrial fibrillation. So let's look at how this would work. Well, you would maybe get a fluttering in your chest. Maybe you get a bit of shortness of breath. You start to feel a bit unwell. You then have to activate the ECG on your watch. So you, there are many different ways you go about that. You could push the crown, the face. There's a bunch of different ways these watches work, but essentially you have to activate your watch to do the ECG. So then the watch usually asks you to be quiet, sit in a, uh, uh, seated in a spot, and then you can actually, um, it will do the ECG for you. It then interprets it and says, hey, you either have atrial fibrillation or you don't have atrial fibrillation and that you should check with your healthcare provider regarding this. It then saves that and it saves it to your smartphone as a PDF uh, format. Now, the problem with this is 
as I told you earlier, is that many patients don't know they have atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation doesn't always cause symptoms. So if you don't have any symptoms, how are you going to activate the watch to do an ECG? This does not continually monitor your heart and tell you if you have atrial fibrillation. Wouldn't that be great if you could wear your watch and it would continually monitor your heart and tell you if your heart ever went into atrial fibrillation. That would be a game changer. And folks, that is the game changer we're gonna talk about today. All right, this is great news. And the continuous monitoring of your heart rate has been approved for the Apple Watch in the United States and Canada. And it will occur later this fall with Watch OS 9. Now the great feature of this is, is it will work on the older watches. So you don't have to spend any more money. The watch, the Apple Watch you have now, this will occur on it. It is just a software update. This is likely going to occur with the Fitbit series as well, as there is a big study that is just completing with the Fitbit line to confirm the same. The sophisticated sensors in the back of these watches on the, on the back surface monitor your heart. And with a software change, we can monitor them on a 24 hour basis. This is going to be a game changer, folks. You'll be able to wear your watch 24 seven and it's going to tell you uh, if you have had any history of atrial fibrillation. It's going to track your heart on a 24 seven basis. It's going to tell how long your heart was in atrial fibrillation. It's going to tell us the time, the amount of time it was in atrial fibrillation and what time of day or week it was most active. This is valuable information for healthcare providers. When I was practicing medicine, this would have been a game changer for me. Because of course, what we want to do is know is if patients remain in atrial fibrillation after we have treated them for them. Some of the treatment for atrial fibrillation is to get you out of atrial fibrillation, whether it's through surgery or, or medication. We want you to be out of atrial fibrillation, or if you're going to stay in atrial fibrillation, you need to be anticoagulated. So we need to know what your heart is doing on a continuous basis. And this solves the problem, folks. This is it. This is what we've been waiting for. At the American Heart Association in 2021, Google presented their Fitbit study to evaluate atrial fibrillation involving 450,000 people that took part. The algorithm Google used correctly identified atrial fibrillation in 98% of the time. Now, the exciting part about this uh, was that it was done using a wide variety of Fitbit devices, not just the Fitbit Sense. It is possible with the software change that most of the Fitbit line can now continuously monitor you for atrial fibrillation. And we know that around 12 million people in the United States this year will have atrial fibrillation. And this certainly is more prevalent with advancing age, hypertension, and obesity. So it is so important that we identify these folks so we can get treatment and of course prevent the complications such as stroke, congestive heart failure. So we expect to see this fall changes in the software to uh, Apple and Google software that will allow continuous monitoring for atrial fibrillation, which will be a big help in the medical management of this very serious condition. In summary, let's look at what we've learned today. The first thing is you now understand the word atrial fibrillation and should know what it is. The th second thing you learned today is that it's common and it's even more common after the age of 60 and 16 million patients in the United States will have a period of atrial fibrillation this year. And three is you now know 
that it is the third leading cause of stroke. The good news is, of course, we have the Apple Watch, the Fitbit Sense, and the Galaxy Watch 4 that have been approved by the FDA and in Canada for the evaluation of atrial fibrillation. And now on your watch, with the click of a button, you can now do an ECG, which is interpreted and will tell you if you have atrial fibrillation or not. But after today's seminar, you now know that a lot of people don't have symptoms with atrial fibrillation. But the good news is coming because Apple has now confirmed that with Apple Watch OS 9, we'll be able to continually track and monitor for atrial fibrillation on a 24-hour basis. And this will be available on most Apple Watches. You won't have to go and buy a new watch. You've also learned today that Google is following suit with this. And I expect a big announcement uh, since their Fitbit study was done in 2021. I expect probably a big announcement with the in introduction of their new Google Watch this fall. This will have the new version of Android Wear on it and we'll likely see a continuous monitoring as Apple has done. The technology is there. I'm excited about this. I think this is going to be a big feature. So let me just summarize. Um, that video was made about a year ago, so things have changed a bit. Um, so I talked to you about too slow and too fast, and you can buy a $10 watch and it will tell you if your pulse is too slow or too fast. But the problem is if it's too fast, is it atrial fibrillation? We don't know that, but you can now tell that by wearing either the Apple watch, the uh, Fitbit watch, or, a, or the um, uh, um, Samsung watch, the Galaxy watch. So those, those three watches have the ability to do what we call an ECG and actually identify atrial fibrillation. So if you have a watch and you all, maybe you have a smart watch, it's not one of those three. Well, you have a big advantage because you can tell if you're too slow or too fast. If it's too fast, well, then you go to your doctor and say, hey, I think my pulse is too fast and he'll check it out or they'll, they'll check it out. But if you have one of those three watches, then you can actually do some more stuff yourself and you can figure out if, in fact, it's atrial fibrillation. Now, the other thing, and that video was made um, about a year ago. So the other thing that has happened is, and this is important, is that uh, let's take the Apple Watch. The Apple Watch now has a regular heart rate notification where it monitors your heart on a 24, not 24 seven, but it periodically looks at it through the day and it will tell you if it will notify you if you have atrial fibrillation. And that's called a regular heart rate notification. You can turn that on, but it's also good for a lot of the prior versions of Apple Watches. You don't have to have the latest watch. So this is great news. Fitbit Sense and the Fitbit line now have this on, on a lot of the line now, not just the Fitbit Sense. Even if your watch doesn't do an ECG, the irregular heart rate notification is available on most Fitbit, um, Fitbit watches. So you need to look at that and see if your watch is compatible and turn that on. So even if it doesn't do an ECG, it's going to monitor your heart and it's going to notify you if you have atrial fibrillation. And the, of course, the Galaxy Watch, uh, the Galaxy Watch does that as well. And that, that has been available now uh, for a number of months and it's working out really well. So if you do have those watches, please, and, and even if you, you have not those specific models, if you have a Fitbit, Fitbit watch, then please look for the irregular heart rate notification and turn that on because it'll continually monitor your heart and let you know if you have any, um, any problems. So that's sort of where we are now. Uh, we're going to talk now a little bit about blood pressure. Uh, smart watches can actually take your blood pressure. Is this important? Is there something here that you should be interested in? And I thought it was interesting and we can talk about blood pressure. And this is a video about smart watches and blood pressure. So let's watch this now and then we'll do some questions later. It's Ron Brown with 
Tetris Senior. Today I'm going to put on my physician's coat and we're going to talk about blood pressure. We're going to talk about the importance of blood pressure, how you take your blood pressure, and also the two new ways we're using to incorporate blood pressure into smartwatches. Yes, smartwatches can now take your blood pressure. So let's have a look at this. Blood pressure and your watch. Why is this so important? Well, an elevated blood pressure is actually called hypertension. And the thing you should know is that it is common. It is extremely common to have elevated blood pressure, particularly as a senior. The second thing you need to know, this is a silent killer. This is a major contributor to heart and kidney disease. So it is so important that we pay attention to our blood pressure, get treatment for it, and follow it closely. That is why I'm so excited about new technology coming into watches that actually measures your blood pressure. Is this a game changer? Is this going to be better than actually taking it on your wrist or arm? No, not really, but I hope this will bring awareness and enthusiasm to patients so that we can be on top of this very, very common problem. So what is the difference between your pulse and your blood pressure? Well, as you know, your heart beats, oh, let's say 80 beats per minute. Well, we measure one pulse for each beat. So if your heart is going at 80 beats per minute, then your pulse would be 80 beats per minute. If you're running or exercising and it goes up to 100, then your pulse is 100. So it's a measurement of how many times your heart beats per minute. Now, any activity tracker, watch, even the cheapest $10 device that you can get will measure your pulse. It is a super easy thing to do and easy to track how many beats per minute your heart is actually beating. Now, let's talk about your blood pressure. Your blood pressure is different. As you know, your heart contracts down and then it relaxes. That's called a beat. Let's say your blood pressure is 120 over 80. Well, 120 is what we call systolic, or that's when your heart contracts down and that is the maximum pressure in the system. The bottom number is called diastole, and that's when your heart is relaxed. It's the bottom pressure in the system. So we always have a top, which is the top when your heart contracts, and when it relaxes, that's the bottom pressure. So a blood pressure always has two numbers associated with it. As you know, you would need more pressure as we get taller. So think about a snake uh, slithering along on the road. Of course, it doesn't need much pressure to get blood to its brain. But let's take a giraffe who's in the forest and has that very, very long neck, it's going to need a massive heart and a lot of pressure to push that blood all the way up to the brain. So we have adapted over time to sort of figure out exactly how much pressure we need to provide oxygen to our brain. So as you can see, blood pressure is more complicated to measure than a pulse. We have two numbers, we have sort of a pressure number that we have to come up with, and we're going to need some more electronic and gadgetry to try and figure this out. And that's why there are very few watches that actually measure blood pressure. Today in this video, we're going to talk about the different technologies that are coming to allow blood pressure to be measured on a watch. All right, how is blood pressure traditionally taken? Well, you've all had your blood pressure taken, so you know there's a bladder that's placed around your arm. This bladder is then pumped up and relaxed, and we get a blood pressure. This is usually performed by your healthcare provider. In the last 10 years, we have seen automated blood pressure machines come and these are fairly standard now and you can get them for around 50 or 60 dollars and they provide 
excellent blood pressure readings and you don't have to do anything. You just put the cuff around your, your arm. Now we've seen this expand to cuffs on your wrist. In fact, there has been a watch which actually has taken your blood pressure and it's been available for a number of years and it actually has a bladder in the wrist strap and actually pumps up and relaxes. So there are many ways that we can take your blood pressure, but they all involve some sort of bladder being around an arterial source being pumped up and relaxed. The other thing you should know is we can take your blood pressure in different arterial sources. For example, we can take a blood pressure of an upper leg. We can take a blood pressure of your lower leg. We can take the blood pressure of your toe, or we can take the blood pressure of your fingertip. Many different ways in which we can do blood pressure. A fun thing you can do is take the blood pressure between your left arm and your right arm. You'll often find a difference. So there is a standard of which we have defined and all the medical research has all gone to being an observed blood pressure reading in your left arm sitting with your arm being at the level of your heart. And that's basically the standard by which we take blood pressure. Now taking blood pressure in a watch is going to, of course, depart from this standard and let's look how we're going to do that. So how do we get blood pressure from a watch? You normally go into the doctor's office, he puts that thing around your arm. He then puts a stethoscope on your front of your arm and measures your blood pressure. Well, if we have a watch on our wrist and these little flashing lights behind, how does that measure your blood pressure? Well, there are two different technologies that we use. And I'm going to talk about those today and explain them. The first one is called the pulse arrival time or pulse transit time. So it's PAT or PTT. Both these are exactly the same thing. Now, as you know, when your heart contracts down, it creates a wave. It actually can create a pulse, and this is a wave that goes through the arterial system. And the pulse arrival time is the time it takes the pulse wave to travel between two arterial sites. So we can actually measure the time difference and come up with a blood pressure. So how do we do this? Let me explain. So the first thing that happens is when you get your Galaxy 4 watch, you have to calibrate it. And what you're going to do is you're going to take your own blood pressure cuff, put it on your arm and take your blood pressure. Let's say it's 120 over 80. You're then going to enter that into your watch and that's going to calibrate it because we know what your pulse is at that particular time. And this is going to calibrate the amplitude of your pulse and we're going to use that as a reference point for that specific blood pressure. Now, once it's calibrated, let's say you go out and you're doing some exercise and your blood pressure goes up. Well, that's going to actually change the time in which that wave transits between those two points we discussed. And so it's actually not going to measure your blood pressure, it's going to calculate it by the time difference in that wave. So a bunch of calculations occur and your blood pressure now is displayed on your watch. That's the technology called PTT or PAT. It's a calculation from your original blood pressure that you put into your watch. And that is why your watch needed to be calibrated. And it also needs to be calibrated about once a month to use this technology. Now you're going to say to me, oh, is this hocus pocus? Is this really work? Yes, it does work because Samsung has taken a lot of medical research and presented it to the FDA. The FDA has then had their body of experts look at this and said, yes, 
on the Samsung Watch Galaxy Watch 4 and Galaxy Watch 5, this is valid. We actually can get a valid blood pressure on this watch using this technology. Now you have to be very careful because there are a lot of $25 watches out there that will measure your blood pressure using some sort of technology. I have no idea what it is, but I can tell you that the Samsung Galaxy Watch 4 and 5 has been cleared by the FDA to be valid and we really want to get accurate readings because your blood pressure is very important. So be careful on what watches you use and only get the certified ones. So what are the advantages of PAT or PTT? Well, it's relatively simple and it works well on watches. What are the disadvantages? Well, you have to calibrate it and that requires input on the consumer. So it all relies on what that initial blood pressure you put in to calibrate your watch. Because we're not actually measuring your blood pressure, we're doing a calculation on a change in what you are measuring and putting into the watch. So for example, if you don't have a blood pressure machine and you've gone and borrowed one and you're using the wrong size cuff and you put a bad value in, then all your subsequent blood pressures will not be valid. Suppose you don't have enough money, you spend it all on the watch, and you guess and you say, well, I'm just going to put 120 over 80 in, but that's not your real blood pressure. Well, then all the subsequent blood pressures your watch is going to give are all in air. So this technology certainly has some problems and it all requires an accurate calibration. And each month you need to calibrate your watch and make sure that the correct values are there. Because remember, we're only measuring the change in the data that you're putting in that's taken by a traditional blood pressure measurement. And that is called pulse transit time or pulse arrival time. All right, the second way of taking your blood pressure is called photoplasmography. Oh boy, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Photoplasmography. Bet you can't say that backwards. We're gonna call that PPG for short. And it's real simple. This is basically a technology that's been around actually since 1930. It's used widely in medical labs around the world. And it actually is where we look at the flow of blood through the arteries and we use a photo sensor to measure your blood pressure based on a number of parameters as its uh, blood is flowing through the artery. And of course, as you know, the skin on the back of your wrist is very, very thin and a lot of those sensors that we use are the ones that will be detecting the flow of blood in your wrist. And we can calculate this out and figure out what your blood pressure is. And that is called PPG or photoplasmography. And this is going to be probably the new way in which you move ahead when we're doing blood pressure with your watch. So in summary, we have two types of technology. We have pulse arrival time or pulse transit time and we have photoplasmography. One, the first group is just measuring the difference from a blood pressure you are entering in. The second type is of course measuring your actual blood pressure. We'll see both these types used in future watches as this becomes more common. So it's Ron Brown with Tech for Senior. Hopefully that video showed you how the technology works to record your blood pressure on your smartwatch. New technology that we'll be seeing on many future smartwatches coming on the market. All right, um, well, it's interesting because today, uh, a big announcement at uh, Fitbit at Google, and they announced the uh, Fitbit patent smartwatch blood pressure sensor, big, big announcement. 
and it will be coming to most of the Fitbit line. They're now committed in the latter, the second of those two, and they're going to be putting out on all their their Fitbit line. And they just that was announced today. So hey, you're the first to know about it. So it's going it's coming to the Fitbit line. Right now, the only uh, watch that really does your blood pressure, of course, is the Samsung Galaxy Four and Five. Not a big deal, but it's interesting. It's coming, and we're going to see more technologies, um, such as uh, you know, we can do your oxygen level now, uh, sleep tracking. Um, there's soon to be diabetes monitoring. There's going to be all sorts of things as we move ahead that we're going to be able to monitor through through that little device on your wrist. Now. So we've talked about watches, we talked about blood pressure, and I thought it would be fun to talk about something that's not a smart watch, but it's something you can monitor. And this is sort of interesting. We'll, um, we'll just play this then. Cardia mobile device or your smartwatch? Do they do the same thing? Which one would I recommend? <laughs> it's Ron Brown with Tech for Senior. This week a viewer asked me which one I would recommend for her father. She asked me if they did the same things and I had to say, well, sort of. Let me explain my response. So first of all, let me explain what this Cardia Mobile device is. Many of you are wondering what I'm talking about. Now we all know what a smartwatch is. This of course is my Fitbit Sense. So Cardia Mobile is a little device that I'm showing you here. And you put your two fingers on the right side, two fingers on the left side, and this actually does an ECG. Now it does it through an app on your phone. So yes, you do need a smartphone. Yes, you do need to download the app. And the two are connected by Bluetooth. It's available for iOS and Android. And this little device is fairly tiny, and this is a holder for it, and it, I even have it so you can put it on a key ring. Uh, you'll see it sort of in the palm of my hands. It's very tiny. This device was cleared in 2012 by the FDA for doing an ECG and interpreting it as to whether or not you have atrial fibrillation or not. As a physician, I spent most of my life helping folks like you. Now I've retired, I spend most of my time making health-related videos about smartwatches. And I've made more than 22 videos about smartwatches and your health. In this video, to keep it short, I'm going to constantly refer to some of the other videos and put the links in the description for you. So if you don't understand something, the link will be down in the description and you can play that video. So let's get on with it. Oh, don't forget to like and subscribe, please. So the first thing we have to do is talk about two common medical conditions you'll be faced with that go up exponentially after the age of 60. The first one we're going to talk about is atrial fibrillation. And in this diagram, you'll see that when we turn 60, that you'll find that the incidence of atrial fibrillation goes up exponentially with age. So what does all that mean? Well, you don't have to know anything about atrial fibrillation except the four things I'm gonna tell you about now. And the first thing you have to know is that after you saw that graph, you'll understand that it's common. It is very, very common and it goes up exponentially as you get older. The second thing is that you need to know that atrial fibrillation is often associated with a fast heart rate. So you can sometimes pick it up by measuring your pulse. The third thing you need to know is that it's often asymptomatic. In other words, people don't know they have it. And it's estimated about 30% of people with atrial fibrillation don't know they have it. And that's an important point we'll come back to. And the fourth one's the biggie. This is the biggie. It's the third cause of stroke. And this is preventable. So if we can find folks that have atrial fibrillation that don't know they have it and get them treatment, we can prevent a lot of strokes. And heck, who wants a stroke? The second medical problem that you may encounter 
is exactly the opposite. Instead of your heart going too fast, it's going to go too slow. In other words, it just wears out. You know, I mean, our knees wear out and we get new knees. Our hips wear out, we get new hips. Cataracts get replaced. Well, your heart just wears out and it starts to slow down. And you might require a pacemaker. And as you can see in this study from New Zealand, the incidence of pacemaker insertion goes up, guess what? Exponentially as you get older. So the older you get, the more likely it's going to be that you're going to require a pacemaker. So what are the symptoms? Well, bad news. You know, those are the older people that are driving down the highway and they just lose consciousness and have some very bad results. Or those are people that are home and get dizzy, fall and break their hip. So this is a bad thing that to happen. And so this is something that can be picked up by a slow pulse. This is basically what happens is your pulse gets slower and slower and slower until there's not enough oxygen going up to the brain because the flow is so low. Again, this is quite easy to pick up because it's related to your uh, heart rate. So obviously we want to measure your heart rate. Yes, Cardio Mobile will do that. Yes, my smartwatch will do that. But any watch over $10 will easily measure your heart rate. All watches do that. And they usually will tell you if you're going too fast or too slow. So what I simply recommend is that maybe you set the top number to about 130. If it goes over 130, maybe see your doctor, have it analyzed because maybe that's atrial fibrillation. And I would set the low at 60. And if it goes, your heart rate goes below 60, then you might want to see your doctor and find out, hey, is everything okay here? And that could be done with just a $10 device. Put it on your wrist and just measure your, your, uh, your heart rate. And remember, too fast, it might be atrial fibrillation. Too slow, you might need a pacemaker. Simple, $10 investment. All right, let's say your heart starts to flutter. Your $10 watch tells you your heart is going over 130. And after watching this video, you wonder, do you have atrial fibrillation? Wouldn't it be interesting if you could do some sort of test that would tell you if you do or do not have atrial fibrillation without having to go to the doctor? Well, in fact, that's what we call an ECG. And the first device to be able to do that, of course, was this little device here, Cardiomobile. Yes, in 2011, this was the first device that came out that actually did an ECG and would interpret it as to whether or not you had atrial fibrillation. They then taught Apple how to do it, and the Apple Watch was the first watch to be able to do uh, ECG. Following this, of course, the Fitbit Sense, uh, the watch, the uh, Samsung um, watches three, four, and five did that, and of course, uh, we now have the uh, the Pixel Watch does it as well. So we're now able to, all these devices can do FDA approved, because these are actually medical devices, FDA cleared ECGs, but the only thing they do is they tell you if you do or do not have atrial fibrillation. These don't do the same type of ECGs we do in the emergency department in the hospital. So that's important for you to know. All right, so far these two look pretty similar, right? Cardiomobile versus your smartwatch. Well, this past year there was a big game changer. Let's look back at this. Both those devices, you have to have symptoms, then you actually do a manual ECG. You activate it on your watch, which means you have to sort of push the bezel or you have to do, everyone's a little bit different, but it's a manual process that you have to activate. The same thing on Cardio Mobile, you have to get your device out, put your fingers on it and activate it. But remember what I told you earlier, I told you that 30% of people with atrial fibrillation have symptoms. Hmm, that gonna work. Wouldn't it be interesting if these devices that were on your wrist would just simply continuously monitor your heart rate and tell you if you have atrial fibrillation? That would be, that'd be a game changer, right? And that happened this year, folks. This was so important and didn't really get the press I think it deserved. It was called irregular heart rate notification. 
And this is a feature that is on the Apple Watch, not, and it goes back to a whole bunch of earlier Apple Watches as well. The same thing happened with Fitbit. The Fitbit line not only was the Sense, which does the ECG, but the irregular heart rate notification went to a wide variety of models of, um, of the Fitbit line. And the same thing with the Galaxy Watch as well, does the irregular heart rate notification. This is incredible because what it does is it monitors your, um, it monitors your heart rate without you actually having to activate an ECG. It looks for atrial fibrillation. Now this doesn't continuously do this on a 24 seven period. What it does is it selects certain times of the day and does random sampling to see if you have atrial fibrillation. It mostly does this at night. And that's another clue I'm gonna give you. If you do have any of these smart devices and you're concerned about monitoring your heart rate, you always want to wear that watch to bed with you at night. I know if you have always taken your watch off at bedtime, you just have to get used to wearing your watch at night because that's when a lot of this monitoring occurs. Yes, it monitors it and it will send you a notification if you have atrial fibrillation. This is huge because now we can monitor ourselves and find out if we are going into atrial fibrillation when we don't even know it and get treatment for that and prevent a stroke. That's why I wear my Fitbit Sense. I don't want to have a stroke. Now I've produced a video, how to prevent a stroke with a smartwatch, which explains all this, how to install it, how the app works, everything you need to know about this feature. I'll put the link down below and you can just click that and watch that video. All right, because of the irregular heart rate notification, my vote is going to go towards the devices you wear on your wrist because you can get continuous monitoring. Of course, you can't get continuous monitoring with this device because you have to pull it out and do a manual ECG. So what are my final thoughts about this device? Well, it's interesting because this device actually comes in two different models. There is a model that's more expensive and it's called the 6L Cardio Mobile device. This device gives a six lead ECG. Now, you don't need to know what a six lead ECG means, but it's almost as good as a hospital ECG. It provides an incredible amount of information about your heart, something the other devices just don't do. The problem is, is the type of information it's going to give you really needs to be interpreted by a healthcare provider, most likely a cardiologist. So in certain situations, this could be beneficial, but you'd have to talk to your healthcare provider because they would be play a key role in getting that information, interpreting it, and giving you advice back. So it's something that you really need to um, talk to your healthcare provider before spending your money on the 6L version of the Cardia mobile device. Okay, uh, any questions? Okay, Ron, you got a tough question this time. A tough question. <laughs> yeah, you got a tough question for you this time. Where do you shop where you can get a $10 watch? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's amazing. If you look on Amazon and you uh, you type in watches, it's uh, it's amazing what you'll you'll find. Um, and you, I guess, one of the things that I wanted to, everyone to know is that you don't need to spend $300 on a smartwatch. Uh, you can buy something very inexpensive and just measure your pulse. And if it's too slow or too fast, then you, you know, it's that's all you need in a lot of cases. Now it's cool, the, the things I've shown you tonight, there's a, certainly a lot of uh, better tech, like really cool technology we can use. But if everyone just wore a $10 watch and checked their pulse to make sure it's not going too slow and or not going too fast, wow, we would pick up all sorts of problems and maybe prevent stroke and prevent serious accidents. So it's, it's a simple thing that you can do.